Welcome. Welcome to this very special evening, co-hosted by the League of Women Voters of Larchmont and Mamaroneck and Mamaroneck High School, with our guest, New York Attorney General Eric Schneiderman, speaking on how to restore public trust and confidence in Albany. Welcome to our elected representatives, school officials, teachers, students, parents, and members of our community. I am Beth Radow, one of tonight's co-hosts. In addition to practicing law and teaching sustainability action to educators at Manhattanville College, I am a board member of the local League of Women Voters and chairwoman of the Committee on Energy, Agriculture, and the Environment for the New York State League of Women Voters. My co-host, the esteemed Joe Liberti teaches. <laughs> teaches AP government and politics at Mamaroneck High School. Mr. Liberti is known for significantly expanding upon the in-class learning experience of his students by taking them on road trips to observe our government in action and participate in candidates' campaigns. These first-hand experiences have been known to inspire Mr. Liberti's students to major in government at college. Woody Allen correctly observed that 80% of life is showing up. It's the combination of determination and action with the remaining 20% that can produce powerful outcomes, good or bad. We live in a capitalist economy under a democratic form of government on a planet with finite natural resources. We have the potential to create a future of possibilities or challenges of epic proportion. We elect representatives to create enforceable laws that will help balance and manage these complexities. The goal at issue is to avoid the potential conflicts of interest that can result from the significant donor funding required to become and stay elected. Once elected, do our representatives act with their major donors or their constituents in mind? Please consider that the skills of the people we elect to govern us matter a lot. Individual achievement matters, of course, but we also need to attract representatives in statewide and national elections with the experience and in inclination to work collaboratively across political party lines to achieve a sustainable democracy, one truly of the people, by the people, and for the people. So to all the students out there, assigned to work on group projects, the skills you gain from working together will truly give you a leg up later on working in the public sector or the private sector and as engaged citizens. An epic example of successful collaboration in the private sector relates to the suffragettes who swapped living life on the sidelines with joint action on the front lines, resulting in 1920 after 72 years of persistence and the end of World War I in the passage of the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote. Tonight we will hear about restoring the value to our vote by restoring the role of our elected representatives. Consider that we probably would not be having this conversation with an audience of males and females if nearly 100 years ago determined forward-thinking women and men had not collaborated over decades to make possible the right of women to vote. Carrie Chapman Catt, the woman who led the suffragettes in the later years of this ultimately successful effort, established the League of Women Voters in 1920 as a nonpartisan political organization focused on making democracy work. Consistent with its original mission today, with 800 state and local chapters across 50 states, the League encourages voter turnout and active participation in government. We hold candidates' debates, and we seek to ensure the role of transparent and effective government through educating citizens and our elected representatives and advocating for legislation on key issues. In addition to voting, beginning at age 18, everyone of any age is encouraged to express your views to elected representatives by mail, email, telephone, and in person throughout the year. Our elected representatives lead busy lives. 
As their constituents, you play an essential role by communicating to them what you consider most important. We in Larchmont and Mamaroneck are fortunate to have open access to our dedicated state senator, George Latimer, and state assemblyman, Steve Otis. To keep up with issues, visit the National State and Local League of Women Voters websites and join us to carry on our mission to keep democracy strong. League membership information and voter registration forms are on the table outside. I understand that not everybody had an opportunity to leave their email address. Please uh, do so. Um, if you are so inclined, please do donate for our Students Inside Albany program. It gives us an opportunity to select and send uh, some students to Albany to see government in action. Please join us for our candidates debate at 7 p.m. on October 28th at Town Center. If you're not able to attend, it will be taped by LMC TV. And please vote in the November 3rd elections. Speaking of the importance of collaboration, this event could not have been possible without the solid partnership of Joe Liberti, the interest of his fellow teachers. <laughs> The interest of his uh, fellow teachers, the welcome of Mamaroneck High School's principal Elizabeth Klain, the support of my board members and the district's director of public Ed information, Debbie Mineta, as well as the committed professionals who work with the Attorney General. Thanks too to LMC TV for taping this event and the media for covering this important topic. We will welcome the Attorney General in just a moment. Please first welcome my co-host, Joe Liberti. Thank you. First, uh, thank you to Beth for all you do. Your tireless commitment to participatory democracy, as well as important issues, serve as an inspiration to all of us. Also want to quickly thank all the students for coming out tonight. Your attendance is so important, so important for these types of events so that you too can become informed and engaged citizens. So please continue. Now, it is my honor to tell you about Eric Schneiderman, an effective problem solver and a man of action who was elected to office as New York State's 65th Attorney General on November 2nd, 2010. In his post as New York's highest ranking law enforcement officer, Mr. Schneiderman has undertaken tough challenges to protect New Yorkers with the goal of having one set of rules for everyone, no matter how rich or powerful. He has also focused on creating a fair and stable economy that works for all New Yorkers. For example, the Attorney General has taken on the big banks that led us into the recent crippling economic recession. This includes leadership in the national effort that secured a $16.7 billion settlement with the Bank of America and a $13 billion settlement with J.P. Morgan Chase for their roles in the housing crisis. These combined are the largest two settlements of their kind in US history. In addition, the Attorney General has also created uh, programs to address New York homeowners, laborers, and those impacted by the drug trade. For families at risk of foreclosure, Eric Schneiderman created the Homeownership Protection Program to help more than 43,000 New York homeowners impacted by the home crisis stay in their homes. In defending the right of all workers to a fair wage for a full day's work, since 2011, Attorney General Schneiderman has secured more than $20 million in restitution for more than 17,000 workers all across New York. And while dismantling drug trafficking rings that infiltrate New York's neighborhoods with illegal drugs, Attorney General Schneiderman also created the Community Overdose Prevention Program. It's a $5 million commitment to equip law enforcement agencies with naloxone, a life-saving antidote that can reverse heroin overdose. For students who are wondering about the Attorney General's academic path to his current post, he attended high school in Manhattan, Amherst College, and finally Harvard Law School. And he is also a proud father of a daughter, Catherine. Throughout his career, including as a public interest lawyer, a New York State Senator, and currently as Attorney General, Eric Schneiderman has demonstrated leadership 
pressing for ethics reform and more open, accountable government. As Attorney General, he has locked up corrupt politicians who cheated taxpayers. Before the end of the 2015 legislative session in Albany, which involved the highest ranking leaders in the state Senate, as well as the state assembly being arrested on federal corruption charges, Attorney General Schneiderman introduced a bill called the End New York Corruption Now Act to reform the legislature and strengthen the role of prosecutors. Tonight, Attorney General Schneiderman will discuss this bill and his vision for restoring public trust in Albany. We will then pose questions prepared by the League of Women Voters and my AP Gov students. Please join me now in welcoming New York State Attorney General Eric Schneiderman. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you. Uh, I don't recall ever seeing any teacher in my high school get that kind of applause, so <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on here, but this is uh, impressive. Thank you for all coming out tonight. Um, this is uh, an encouraging sign to have this many people come out to discuss ethics in government. It's not always uh, seen by people as the most riveting topic. It's uh, more important than reality TV or the political shows that pass for reality TV these days. Um, I want to thank Elizabeth Klein, the principal. I want to thank, uh, whenever I get into a high school, I have the compo I'm compelled, I feel compelled to call you Mr. Liberty, you know? It's sort of a, just a, a natural thing. But Joe Liberty, who sounds like you run a fascinating class that gets people out into the, into the field as well as into the classroom. And um, thanks to Beth for that uh, great talk. She touched on something that I will get back to in my remarks, uh, having to do with uh, movement building in America and the movement, the suffrage, women's suffrage movement and the League of Women Voters that arose out of that. It's very much a part of my view of how we've gotten where we have gotten in America, how we built this incredible structure, this incredible republic, and how we need to get back on track. I note that we're also um, joined by Gary Brown, who's the head of my Westchester Regional Office and represents us up here. <laughs> day in, day out. Um, so I want to, uh, have, I have, long, I have a, quite a set of remarks here because I want to talk about politics in the big sense and, and government in the big sense, but I also have been asked to get into some of the details of my anti-corruption legislation and where we stand right now in Albany. Um, but I do have to say, and I know, uh, thank you all for coming out. I thank the students, but thanks to, to the rest of you who are uh, former students, parents, or teachers, whoever. It's, it's great to see you here. I, um, I do want to say to the, and it's encouraging to see so many young people. First of all, I can't tell you how demoralizing it is for people who work every day and fight very hard to make the world a better place to have the sense that the younger generation is really very disengaged. And that is a widespread perception. And uh, I, have a, I have a daughter who's in college, so uh, just a few, years, a few years ahead of some of you. And it's great to see this many young people here, and it's great that you are getting out in the field to see that you can, in fact, make a difference. I believe very much in public service, and I believe very much in politics. And a lot of people use politics as a disparaging word. It literally means the way we make decisions is a collective. It comes from the term polis. Politics is a good thing. The alternative to politics before politics was war. So the idea of the United States of America was that ordinary people could participate in politics, not just kings and aristocrats. So to me, refusing to, to participate in the political process is kind of un-American. But this is not necessarily a widespread, right, widespread view in, uh, in, among people in government and people in power in the private sector. But it really is uh, important to have a, the visible support and enthusiasm of your generation for us to sustain this incredible American tradition of moving forward towards our national ideals decade after decade, century after century, which has happened through a series of reform movements. Um, New York is the home to a lot of the greatest in American politics and the greatest in American government. You're in a terrific place to do this. We are the state 
that had the audacity to build the Erie Canal and not just change the economy, but change the geography of North America. And it was because we had this amazing forward-thinking group in, the, in our public sector and with a forward-thinking group in the private sector, because right today, if you brought this to uh, an investment advisor, you would be told it was an insane investment. Please do not go there. The Erie Canal will never work. But the New York tradition of public-private partnership is something that has made our state unique and has made our state great. And it's a great time to be involved in politics in New York. When people say, Albany's a mess, I say, lots of upside. You know, lots of good things we can do to improve it. And for reasons I'm going to discuss, it is a very important time to be involved in particular in state and local politics. And so the history of New York is a history of innovation. It's a history of governmental transformation. The, the uh, amazing accomplishment some decades after the Erie Canal, the vision to build the Metropolitan Transportation Authority that moves 8 million people a day, the engine of our economy, uh, extraordinary, again, public work through the government, from officials elected by the people, in partnership with the private sector. So this has been our tradition for more than 200 years. A lot of us in politics view the, uh, the process as we know it as having originated really in the presidential campaign of 1800. Has anyone here seen Hamilton? Uh, everyone here should see Hamilton. And I don't just say that because it was written by a guy I know from Washington Heights. It is an amazingly inspiring story. Uh, it is a breakout musical. It's, what do you say about an author who says he read a 600-page biography of Alexander Hamilton and said, wow, that is the most hip-hop story I've ever read. I have to write a musical to it, which is, in fact, what happened. But it's all about what happened in New York in, in the founding, at the founding of the Republic when the Federalist Papers were being published and in the campaign of 1800, which was the first time candidates ever campaigned personally. Uh, the mechanics of American politics really started in New York. And as noted in Hamilton, as noted in Lincoln, as noted in, in lots of publications, uh, New York state politics dating back to the 1700s has been a very tough game. And I want to focus a little bit on that tonight before coming back to, uh, to my broader theme. There is a perception out there that New York is more corrupt than it's ever been. Now, admittedly, when the head of the Senate and the head of the Assembly are both indicted in the same three-month period, bringing a legislative session to its knees, and you could, people could get the wrong idea about the level of ethics in Albany. And new investigations seem to pop up every week. But my friends, I would suggest to you that this is actually really good news, because since the 1700s, we have had problems of corruption in New York, in New York City, in New York State government. Famous, famous corrupt politicians, world famous corrupt politicians. I mean, we have the most famous corrupt politicians at Boss Tweed, uh, Plunkett of Tammany Hall. The, the, this is something that's happened in New York periodically, and we are, feel like we're living in a golden age of graft because more things are coming to light. And I can say this to you as someone who's worked in um, in law and government, and I spent uh, 15 years in private practice. It was a associate and then a partner in a big law firm. I know, I've know uh, the corporate sector very well, and I've also worked in the government now for about as long. Um, this is something that has been happening for a long time. Practices that were corrupt were going on, but prosecutors weren't really going after them. There was this very, very um, uh, sort of a tacit agreement that exists in a lot of places in the United States to this day, that prosecutors uh, who would, would sort of turn a blind eye to conduct by elected officials, because prosecutors in America either are elected officials themselves or appointed by someone who was elected. That's not happening now. I'm very, very proud to say that the federal prosecutors in the state of New York and the office of the New York State Attorney General, because I'm heavily involved in this anti-corruption effort, are no longer turning a blind eye to practices that have gone on for a very long time. Over the past four years, uh, in large part through a very innovative partnership uh, my office developed with the state controller Tom DiNapoli, we have uh, gone after more than 70 corrupt officials and their cronies all across the state. Our 
counterparts in the U.S. Attorney's Office have gone after more. And the sense that there is this wave of corruption really should be viewed as a sense that there is a much more aggressive effort to root out corruption and to prosecute corruption than we've seen really probably ever in the history of New York State. So uh, seeing a lot of people getting busted doesn't mean more people are committing more crimes. It just means you have more aggressive cops on the beat who are doing their job. But the goal of prosecuting and investigating corrupt officials is not just to prosecute and investigate more corrupt officials. And this is the central point I really want to make. We need to channel the outrage at corruption into a reform movement. We have to demand change. And one of the central uh, themes in my office is that uh, I tell the folks who work for me, catching bad guys is good. But changing systems, changing conduct, so there are no more bad guys to catch is better. And we've done that in area after area. Uh, Mr. Liberty, sorry, I can't help myself. It's just Mr. Liberty. Um, uh, mentioned some of the work we've done on drugs. Uh, the problem of overprescribing of, of prescription opioids was a huge problem when I got into office. We could have spent our time just chasing more pill mills and people who were involved with doctor shopping. Instead, we focused on the problem from the point of view of trying to end it all together. And New York is now the only state that has a real-time prescription database that shows every doctor and pharmacist how many prescriptions you got. You can't get two oxycodone prescriptions in New York State. We're the only state in the country like that. In the first year after our iStop program, which was developed by my office, was implemented doctor shopping, meaning two prescriptions for the same thing from two different doctors, dropped by 75%. That's the approach we seek to bring in my office. And when it comes to public corruption, the idea is not just to lock people up, but to channel the public anger about this into reform proposals that make the system better for a long time. We have had in incredibly successful reform movements in New York uh, for uh, hundreds of years. The, the best example I can use as an analogy, analogy to today is the incredible reforms that took place in the early 1930s after massive corruption was exposed. This was at the time in the city of New York. Mayor James Walker was driven from office. There was an investigator called Judge Samuel Seabury who exposed all of this widespread corruption. People went through a period of time of saying, oh, it's more corrupt than ever. But then they channeled this into a reform movement and they created what was called a fusion movement. They elected Fiorello LaGuardia as a reform mayor. They rewrote the charter of the city of New York, which is more or less the city's constitution. And channeled the anger at corruption into reform. So I would suggest to you that I, I'm going to talk about my reform legislation uh, as, I've, uh, as I've been requested to get into some of the details, and I gather at least the students here have learned something about it. But I want to make it clear at the outset. Our goal is not more indictments. Our goal is reform. Our goal is to change the systems so that we can accomplish the stated goals of our government, and it's a pretty good to-do list. The United States of America was set up with some pretty extraordinary aspirations. Again, when you go to see Hamilton, it brings it back very evocatively. But this was a, an experiment in democracy based on the idea that people could govern themselves that had never been tried before. And the aspirations for greater justice and greater equality with every generation were clearly there at the founding. I think we have to remind ourselves of that and recommit ourselves to that project. And cleaning up our state government is a critical step to that end. So my reform legislation that I introduced this past spring uh, has three main goals. The first is to end the corrosive effect of money on politics and government in New York. Second, to make sure that every act of corruption is met with a swift and serious response. And finally, and most importantly, to uh, make it clear that we've cleaned up our political and governmental system enough so that we can attract and motivate more honorable people to enter public service. Because it's a self-perpetuating process. When people get discouraged and they think the government is corrupt, it's harder to get good people to run for office. And, and the problems are harder to solve. Now, I've been involved in New York uh, as an activist, not as an elected official, for a very long time. I've, 
We have a great coalition of reform groups, League of Women Voters, joined by Citizens Union, NYPIRG, Common Cause. I used to represent NYPIRG, Citizen Action of New York. I was on the board. I was, when I was in private practice, I was a part of the sort of the outside agitator reform movement. We've got a good infrastructure. But for too long, those of us who thought of ourselves as reformers were willing to tinker around the edges, to accept incremental reforms. We've had amazing announcements pretty much every year now, it used to be every other year, that this is the most sweeping reform legislation ever to pass in Albany. We have cleaned everything up. It is the cleanest act ever in Albany act. And then the next year, we pass another cleanest act in Albany act, because four more people have gone to prison. And the year after that, we pass another. Now we're really serious about cleaning up Albany act. And all of these have been tinkering around the edges. So I took a pledge earlier this year when I introduced uh, my uh, comprehensive reform legislation that I'm done with tinkering. I've taken a pledge. No more, no more celebrations of marginal reforms because the pattern is just too familiar. We will have a scandal followed by public outrage. People will jump together, political figures will jump together and say, here we are passing a package of reforms that really don't solve the problem. The public outrage goes away and then there's another scandal and the cycle repeats itself. So. The reforms that I've proposed, and I want to go through them in a little bit of detail, uh, are much more fundamental than that. The first and most critical reform is legislators in New York State are now allowed to treat their office as a part-time job. In the off time, they're allowed to work, many of them as lawyers representing major companies, some of them actually working at companies uh, that have business before the state. Now, in my view, if you work for the people of the state of New York, you don't need any more clients. It should be full-time. Uh, what I'm offering in return is that we pay legislators like full-time professionals that they are. New York State legislators are paid less, not just than members of the House of Representatives, they are paid less than members of the New York City Council. And uh, I would even support a constitutional amendment extending their terms from two years to four years as a part of this comprehensive reform. We want our legislators to focus on governing, not fundraising and politics. Four-year terms would also make it easier uh, for watchdogs to monitor what's happening and for our campaign finance system, which is a part of my proposal, uh, to work effectively. Now, there are some people who are always going to violate the laws. In New York, it is very difficult for state Leg state prosecutors to go after public corruption. So my bill would change that, make it much easier for state prosecutors to pursue cases of public corruption, to pursue public bribery. It would, has a whole set of reforms to the criminal statutes, would empower the office of the attorney general, which does not have general jurisdiction over uh, uh, political corruption, to enforce the law in these areas. And finally, my legislation would change the pay to play culture by reforming our absurd campaign finance laws. We have to lower the contribution. Thank you, thank you. Well, someone who's been working, I can see this is the enthusiasm uh, of, of, of people who have been working on this for a while, but I really do believe that we're reaching a point of public outrage that if we are smart about it, we can bring this about. Uh, our contribution limits are essentially non-existent. Every person can give a statewide official $60,800. Every limited liability corporation owned by any uh, businessman, real estate developer, can give $60,800. You can write a check for $10 million to a state party committee. And since Michael Bloomberg is no longer involved in politics, no one is writing checks at that level anymore, but it is theoretically possible, and people do write enormous checks. Um, we have to close that LLC loophole and, and have much tougher rules on contributions from lobbyists and anyone who has business before the state. To accomplish this and enable good people to run for office, I think we should emulate the very successful model of the New York City campaign finance system, have a matching fund system, so if you raise small amounts of money, you'd have the resources to run for office, even if you are of modest means. The, thank you. Now, as I've mentioned, I'm a believer in American political movements, and whether your biggest passion is the environmental movement or the labor movement and workers' rights or consumer protection. It, you, the, sec, the thing you should be the second most passionate about is money and politics. Because what is on the other side from you uh, is usually someone with a big checkbook contributing to block common sense proposals to make most people's lives better. Nowhere demonstrated more dramatically than in the case of the environment in which uh, 
we are literally destroying our planet, and yet our elected officials seem to be unable to overcome these obstacles of, uh, uh, that are generated, to my view, in large part, by the current campaign finance system. Whatever your fight is, someone with a bigger checkbook is probably on the other side if common sense laws are not being passed. The, at the end of the day, I've told my colleagues in Albany over and over again, there are two paths forward. More scandals, more investigations, further erosion of public confidence, or more comprehensive reform than has ever been done before. I've presented a package of reforms I think would do the trick. I'm not saying it's the only way to do it, but it's gonna be reform at that level. It has to be comprehensive. And I'm working now to mobilize people into a reform movement. I think that we are in a unique moment in New York State, and over the next couple of years, I think a political movement will rise up out of this outrage, and it's up to all of us. And let me say a few words about movement politics. Uh, at the outset of the United States, we had incredibly high aspirations, and the founders, no fools, uh, understood that we really didn't meet those aspirations at the time. When Thomas Jefferson wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, they all knew it wasn't true. Slavery was widespread. Women weren't even in the sentence, by the way. Uh, the Jews couldn't vote and couldn't own property in most of America. It, all men were not created equal. All people were not created equal. And yet that was set forward as an aspiration. So the history of the United States, if you look at it uh, in, in the way I look at it, is a history of movements to make Thomas Jefferson's words ever more true. And it's up to each generation to take on the challenge of making those words ever more true. And if you look at the series of movements that have brought us to be more democratic and more equal and more just than we were in the 1790s, the abolition movement, the women's suffrage movement that led to the League of Women Voters, the civil rights movement, the labor movement, you've seen um, even if you're very young, you've probably seen in your lifetime the movement of the LGBT equality movement and how that's changed public consciousness. Movements are what make American politics work. Politics in the short-term sense of what bill I can pass today is what I call transactional politics. It's important, but it's the broader movement politics that really has moved America forward over the decades, over the centuries, and we do need to understand that it is only with a reform movement that we will truly get a cleaned up government in New York State to realize the enormous potential that our state has, to make sure that all of our children get a good education, to make sure that every family can believe life will be better for their kids and grandkids than it is for them, and that everyone can get a family supporting job here in the state of New York. The possibilities are as broad as your imagination. But let me point out one other thing about this history of movements. There has never been a movement a great movement in American history that was started by an elected official. Movements are always started by ordinary activist citizens, people who want to push the status quo. And there are very few elected officials that are ready to jump up and say, I am at the top of the heap under the status quo and yet I seek to change it. So I would encourage you not to sit around waiting for elected officials to lead a reform movement. You'll get from your elected officials what you make them give you. And that is the American system. They came into being, the United States, in a world where there was this rigid structure of government, where aristocrats and kings had power, and ordinary people had, really didn't have much power in the way of pushing them to do the right thing. We created a system that is designed for ordinary people to push their elected representatives to do the right thing. So it's time to get back to pushing. That doesn't mean you do it hostily, it doesn't mean you treat people with disrespect, but it's time to build a reform movement. And my legislation is, I think, a pretty comprehensive view of what has to be done to clean up the state government, but it's time for a reform movement to return public confidence that this, in fact, is our government. This is our polis that we participate in politics so that we can collectively make decisions. That's what the United States is about, and that is what I hope my office is about, and I think that we've done some extraordinary work in, in laying the groundwork for this and working with the philosophy of trying to bring about bold change. But to fundamentally change the political system, we need a movement led by citizen activists. And I hope that there are some people here tonight that will be a part of that movement. And one word for high school students. You never know who in your class is actually gonna be a big deal in 20 years. 
So I would suggest at least be polite to everybody, because sometimes it comes as a tremendous surprise. I assure you my classmates would be very surprised that I'm the New York State Attorney General. The, um, but please, take this is my message, and now I want to go to questions and answers. We can clean this up. We can move America forward. We can move it forward to, uh, to, in terms of economic and social equality. But w the most fundamental element of this is to restore the government to its proper place as a functioning representative of the people. You have the power to do that. And I hope you'll go out of here tonight a little more inspired and a little more aware of the possibilities. Thank you very much. Are you inspired? Are you inspired? All right. We've got two questions from the League of Women Voters, and we have uh, three questions from our students. Um, our first question relates to the Attorney General's proposed, one of the legs or criteria of the proposed legislation. Please explain the rationale for a full-time legislator with no outside income, and how the cost and benefit translates to the average taxpayer. Um, I assure you that if you get the influence of money out of politics, uh, you will save money the first legislative session that you pay legislators full-time and prohibit them from having any outside uh, business affiliation. The, the New York State has a a uh, remarkable process that we go through um, where everything is negotiated in the dark and most bills pass at the end of the, most controversial bills particularly, pass at the very end of a legislative session when they're spewing out dozens of bills an hour. Um, it results in uh, tax breaks for companies by name it resulted a few years ago famously in tax breaks for five buildings that were, their addresses were listed and they got treated differently than every other building. Uh, so you can see the evidence of the influence of money in politics everywhere. Uh, uh, many years ago, uh, you know, I was looking at the old, there was a commuter tax where commuters would pay some money to the city of New York uh, to pay for the services they used when they were there and I was reviewing the exceptions to the commuter tax for active duty military police officers, or if you worked for an insurance company. <laughs> so you have to wonder what lobbyist in the middle of the night managed to get that into the law. Uh, but when I first got into the state senate, the chair of the Senate Insurance Committee, in fact, was at a law firm that had as his clients insurance company. So I think that the idea is um, you pay people a little bit more. It's not, not a tiny amount of money. Uh, in terms of, and as is the, the money for public financing. All of those funds will be returned many, many times over when you have a conflict-free legislature that is not answering to their personal uh, patrons and clients and is not answering to their big donors either. You uh, correctly identified some of the frustration that we at the League experience with proposed legislation uh, that doesn't make it to the floor of the Senate, even uh, if it has bipartisan support. So my question, uh, our question is, even considering the separation of powers, what avenues does the Attorney General's office have to address issues affecting the public interest that are reflected in proposed legislation, which has bipartisan support of the legislature, but is blocked from the Senate or Assembly floor for a vote? Well, the, uh, I can introduce my own bill, which I have in fact done and advocated for it. And uh, I also have, just have a platform for advocacy that uh, makes me a good participant in a reform movement. And we have done that. The, the key to understanding why things don't move forward in Albany is uh, really not head counting in the traditional sense. It's very, the most meaningless statement in, in the state legislature is, oh, I, I'll vote for that if it comes to the floor. Because uh, in the Senate and the Assembly, the only people who can ensure that a bill comes to the floor are the leader, majority leader of the Senate and the Speaker of the Assembly. And uh, remarkably, every two years, uh, people get elected after campaigning to the state legislature. And the first vote they take is to elect a leader and transfer the power to determine what bills get to the floor to that leader. After that, um, 
all else is commentary, as we say in a different context. But the, uh, uh, the, the strong leader system in New York is much, much more um, uh, powerful than in any other state. And the key to understanding the need to reform Albany is to understand that. Uh, we get bills to the floor if you're attorney general or you're a high school student by mobilizing, by agitating. You would be shocked at how much of a difference it makes for people to physically show up at a legislator's office. 500 people show up at a legislator's office. It, it, this produces alarm signals that go all over the state. So it's one thing for your member of the legislature to come to their leader and say, I really need to pass a reform bill. It's the right thing to do. Um, where the leader can say, that's very nice, here's some more money to give out for pork in your district, leave me alone. Uh, but if they come and say, there are 2,000 people who've been to my office in the last week demanding that I do this, then you got, they realize that they've got something on their hands. The power really lies in mobilization. It doesn't take that many people to get it done. So the Office of the Attorney General, we try and set examples by uh, bringing creative cases that call attention to issues. We introduce legislation, we draft legislation, I weigh in on things. But if the most important way to get things done in New York State is to be an advocate. I just am a, a, an advocate with a slightly bigger platform than a lot of people, but the, the task is the same. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let me just first say, um, my students really um, give a lot of thought to these questions, uh, showed a lot of nuance and subtlety to politics, and I'm very proud to sort of be the mouthpiece to ask these questions on their behalf. Uh, so his first question comes from Sophie. Uh, how do you get the legislative and executive branches to support your reforms when they seem to be benefiting from the current system? Well, now you have just cut right through there. Sophie, is this Sophie? Yes. <laughs> So what we have to do here is very simple. Uh, if you have a reform movement that is uh, full of people who do not sit down and shut up when they are told to sit down and shut up, you change the incentives for the members of the legislature and the executive branch. They are benefiting from the system in a very narrow sense. They're benefiting from the system in the sense that they can be cogs in the wheel of a big machine fueled by money that enables the narrow agenda of uh, a privileged few to move ahead. And that really poses more challenges for those of us who have a more long-term point of view, uh, where I think it's in everyone's interest to ensure that uh, the interests of all, of all families, all people, all children are met, not just the, the interests of the most powerful corporate inter corporate interests and um, power brokers. So it benefits members of the legislature and the executive if they have a very narrow view of public benefit. The way you get them to, to do that, and this is, I'm saying this in the kindest possible way, is to get them to see that it is in their long-term benefit to actually support reform. They only will respond to that if the public is outraged, because even though there are great people committed reformers in the legislature, their ability to overcome the hurdles posed by the strong leader system, to force the leaders to stand up to, uh, to the folks who support the leadership. How do you stay in power as a leader in Congress or in a state legislature? You raise lots of money to defend your vulnerable, vulnerable members of your party, either you're a Republican leader or a Democratic leader. That's how the game works. So you have to not just overcome the problems with one individual legislature, they have to stiffen their legislator, they have to stiffen their backbone to take on the leadership. And if you understand that and communicate to legislators that you understand that, then you're really in the game. This has been done before over and over again in New York and in states around the country. It's been done nationally in the reform movements I mentioned. So the way to do it is to become activist reformers, inform yourselves, and I gather that you go actually go out and participate in campaigns as a part of this, this class. Have you guys, have, have you been in campaigns already or you're gonna do campaigns? Not yet. So that's a wonderful experience and you get to, you get to see this remarkable phenomenon of convincing people that collectively we can make a decision. We can determine our future together, which is really just an extraordinary, um, for me it's always an extraordinary experience to campaign, whether I'm campaigning for uh, someone else or campaigning for re-election. 
you have to approach this as reformers understanding the nature of movement politics. It is in the long-term interest of everyone in government to break free of these shackles of, of this money-driven, leader-controlled machine politics. And most people go into government because they want to get something good done. The overwhelming majority. You have to speak to that and them, and you have to give them hope that there will be public support to make those aspirations that they may have given up on temporarily possible once again. All right, so this next question comes from the young Mr. Sheehan. Is he here? All right. <laughs> How do you prosecute corruption in New York politics without losing the public's confidence in the political process? So the, to me, um, going after public corruption is a part of restoring public confidence in the process. But the, the, point, the point is well taken. A lot of people have the sense that because there are more prosecutions now, as I said earlier, that this is, the state's more corrupt than it's ever been. In fact, as long as we keep our eye on the ball and understand that the prosecutions are not an end of themselves, but they are a way to mobilize people to action, to reform, to build a movement, then the prosecutions are a critical part of that process. What discourages people more than that is seeing folks get away with the same sort of misconduct year in and year out and pay no price. If there are no consequences for bad behavior, that also sends a bad message to reformers inside the government. It's very demoralizing. So I see prosecutions as a critical part of the process, but they don't do us any good if they are seen by the prosecutors and by the public as the end in and of themselves. Prosecutions point out problems. It's up to us to turn the public's outrage at this misconduct into reforms, not so we can catch more bad guys, so we can make sure that the rules have changed so there are fewer bad guys to catch. That's really at the core of my philosophy as a prosecutor. All right, so our final question comes from Patrick. Uh, <laughs> and you've sort of answered this, but you can, I think this is more directed to the students now. How can I, as a high school student, help support the passage of your reform proposals within the New York State Legislature? Well, uh, I think for a high school student, you can probably do as much or more than anyone else because you got more time. When you get a job and a family, you're, you're kind of busy. But I think that I can reflect to you the fact that uh, as busy as you think you are, believe me, it gets worse. The, uh, <laughs> look, students have been a part of every movement that I have mentioned. All of the great political movements, students were an integral part of them. I mean, I grew up uh, in an era when the civil rights movement was very, very much s still alive. And a lot of incredible action took place in high schools and colleges all across America. I w am old enough to remember the anti-Vietnam War movement when we would leave, <clears throat> we would sometimes uh, leave high school uh, and participate in demonstrations. And sometimes we'd see our teachers at demonstrations too and realize they had left school also. But that was actually an pretty effective movement at accelerating America's withdrawal from uh, a war we should never have gotten into in the first place. Now, we were motivated by the fact that the kids a couple years older than us were getting drafted. So we had a, a, a public interest motivation. We, had, uh, the, we were right about the merits of the issue, but we also had that fire because uh, of watching things happen to people that we knew. But high school students and college students have played a role in every great political movement. The most important thing to understand is it's not necessary to vote to have an impact. Voting is important. It is a minimum, it's the dues you pay for being a part of society. But really, in the concept of the United States is that people do more than vote, that you speak up. For, in the old days, people used to publish pamphlets. People used to speak on street corners. Now on the internet, everyone can publish a pamphlet. Everyone can participate in the debate. You can inspire and mobilize people. Educate yourselves about the reforms that you're the most passionate about, and then get out there and talk about them. Speak, be creative, uh, figure out ways to raise points that have never been raised. The power of mobilizing people in an era in which very few people participate is greater than ever. A very small number of people can move 
big issues right now in America. The expectation of the establishment is that very few people register, very few people vote, and very few people will actually uh, mobilize, write letters to the editor, give speeches, put stuff online, go to visit their legislators, take to the streets. All of those activities are open to you, and they are, and again, uh, you know, again, having just uh, seen this remarkable show, if you go back to the founding of the Republic, this was the whole idea. We could have stayed in a country where no one was able to go out in the streets or vote or agitate or write pamphlets. We had that. The revolution was so we didn't have to live like that anymore. This is the most American tradition you could possibly be a part of. And you can start now. There's nothing stopping you. And I would urge you to get involved and to stay involved. We need to know. And it has a huge impact on those of us who have been around for a while to see the rising generation participating to overcome this notion that people are disaffected and don't really, you know, are disengaged. Get out there and do something, and believe me, you can see the impacts very, very quickly. A small number of folks can make a big difference in a state legislative race or a congressional race or in an, an issue campaign. Uh, it, it is, if you went back five years and you said, well, there's this group of, ragtag group of, uh, sort of nobodies who are opposed to hydrofracking, um, you would have thought, well, that's never going to go anywhere. And it wasn't led by elected officials. And guess what? We're never having hydrofracking in the state of New York. So get out there and do something. <laughs> well, that concludes our evening. We are so honored to have had you here. And I want to say to the students, I'm going to continue to be uh, in touch with Joe Liberti and also Sophia Andrews. I'm going to be coming to your environmental class this spring. We're trying to reduce food waste. Uh, we'd like to enlist your assistance. There is no end to what we can be doing in this community. The League of Women Voters welcomes your participation. It is so true that a few people can make a big difference, and we are so grateful for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really